everyone welcome back brand new take aim podcast excited to get this show out into everybody i know it's been a minute but i previously just been in ohio hunted eight days straight uh daylight to dark basically so i just didn't have time to get out and uh get a podcast done and i did try had a guest that just had canceled but anyways it didn't work out so i you know spent the whole time like i said just basically in the timber and hunting my butt off so Basically, uh, excited to have Sean Kelly back with me and my good buddy, who's the Whitetail Properties Land Agent in Southeast Michigan, and my hunting partner on the lease. And we talked all kinds of stuff in this podcast about what we've learned, good, bad, and indifferent, and just how to hunt something completely new and out of the norm for me and Sean. And uh, you can just tell we've really learned at kind of warp speed, and, and that's what we talked about in this podcast, what we learned and all the different little situations that are different than hunting like here in Michigan or in Indiana where we've hunted a lot. You know, so uh, Ohio's been a really challenging spot for us down there in the south. And uh, But challenging in a great way. We really like it, really enjoy it. And there's some, there's some mega banger of bucks down there. Like, I mean, there's some awesome deer. It's definitely a good, you know, genetic-wise, a good area to be hunting in. So... Hope you guys enjoy the show. As always, we'll uh, we'll be back on track this next coming week. And uh, if you guys get the chance today, you can use the code Black Friday twenty twenty for Hunt Stand to download the Pro version as well. So we'll see you guys again next week. All right, boys and girls, we are live, brand new Take Aim podcast, and uh, happy day after Thanksgiving, it's Black Friday, but excited to be back. I know it's been a minute, but excited to have my good buddy back with us, Sean Kelly, Whitetail Properties Land Specialist, but uh, what's up, Sean? Hey, Brandon, how's it going? Good, man. Excited to have you back, and uh, kind of excited to get this show out and on the road to everybody, so to speak. It's... Uh, you know what I'll call Ohio lease update part two, I guess. But uh, me and Sean have both had some time to, you know, spend down south on our lease in Ohio and just kind of excited to kind of give you guys an update. Me and Sean both had some time down there to, to get some hunting in and uh, just talk about what we've learned and just some of the some of the stories and some of the things we saw and did and, and go from there. But... Uh, Sean, man, I know you uh, You got there a couple days or a day, or the day I left, we both hunted, I think, the same day, but I left when you basically rolled into town, which was unfortunate, but, uh, you know, what are what are your thoughts since we got to spend some, some time down there on the lease during, you know, hunting season, so to speak? Uh, I guess just boots on the ground have given me a different, I guess, uh, viewpoint to look through when I'm looking at things like especially like going back over the topo maps and looking at some of the elevations and being able to look at some of the areas that we haven't been in yet because it's such a big expanse of tough to breach property that I can look at some of the areas now that we haven't been in and have a lot better idea what's there you know I haven't been over you know the stuff that I've been into or that we've been into you can kind of look at the top of maps and then have a, a lot better idea what the other parcels are going to look like when you do get in there. So I've kind of got yeah. that, that going for me now. Yeah, that's for sure. So just to recap a little bit, you know, and hit on what Sean's saying is we have a lease at 1600 acres, 400 of it is bow only zone. We're actually not in that. So But it's all continuous, so it's all one giant piece of 1,600 acres. So we have 1,200 acres. So down south in southern Ohio, it is, you know, again, uh, well, I can't stress enough for me and Sean, this was a brand-new ball game. This wasn't like river bottoms, ag, and, you know, some small, or maybe if you're lucky somewhere in Illinois where you have long stretches of timber. This is just all timber, 
And unlike Illinois, where if you see timber, usually the bottom opens and that timber goes down. This is just the opposite. This this is hill, like what I would call hill country. I mean, me and Sean kind of look at it and you're like, man, it's like borderline mountains. But they're they're big and they go up. And it is timber and timber and timber and timber. But like what Sean's saying, that was basically, since we got in it and saw some of that stuff, it was, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but it was a lot more relatable to what we're looking at. You know, Sean uses Onyx. I use a hunt stand app. And once I started doing that and seeing some of it and using the 3D feature on my hunt stand, it, it really changed the whole game. And you could kind of, uh, you know, read those maps so much better, you know, I, and I'm sure that's what you're meaning, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. Just because you think you got an idea what's there, but then when we got into it, what I expected wasn't what I got. Even And even, like, you know, we, we found some good areas, we set up some spots, and then when you get in there, the wind just, like, you're just like, this is not a good spot, not because there's not deer, it's just not a good spot because it's really hard to hunt given, like, the wind shifting and the thermals and, you know, depending on what direction and what wind speed, you know, the the forecast or whatever the current conditions are, you know, it isn't just like south wind at 10 miles an hour, it's going to blow south, so you set up on the, you know, side of that where you think the deer is coming from and they can come in you know, on the upwind side of you, that stuff's like funneling and blowing all around and shifting and I mean, it's in your face, it's in your back. So you just kind of eliminate them areas. And now you can kind of look at that terrain and, and eliminate some spots that might not be optimal and, you know, gives us a better idea where to focus on so that we got better currents. And, you know, even though, I mean, everything, there wasn't any one thing that I could say, but everything has changed as far as my perception. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's a, yeah. go ahead. You know, wind currents, where you think the deer are going to be bedded, where they're going to be feeding to, you know, it's just, just such a, a different idea of what to do now than when we started. Yeah, for sure. And again, I, I can't explain to anybody enough, Sean, like how different this is as far as like a hunting situation for me and you, I've never hunted anything like this. Maybe you have, but it, or maybe even halfway similar, but I never have. I mean, it is completely different. It it is big, big, huge hills, and then big bottoms that are borderline, like, you know, dangerous. You need to really know where you're walking and paying attention. Some some spots have, like, I'm not kidding, 20, 30-foot cliff stone ledges that you could fall right over. Mm, yeah. So it's it's yeah. really crazy and it's important to know where those are because obviously you're not going to have deer coming from those areas. So if you can pinpoint some of those areas, you then can kind of start to say like, hey, there's a pinch here or this is a funnel where deer have to move around because they can't walk straight up vertically up this cliff. So there, there's things like that, but man, what Sean just touched on with the wind and the wind currents or thermals, that was really insane to me, man. Like, I've never seen anything so unique in my life. Like, I would throw out milkweed, so, and every time I so did it, and, I, and I'm sure, yeah. And, Sean, you did it too, man. But every time I did it, it would be odd to get two of the milkweeds in a row to do the same thing. Yeah, I would. Give it 10 minutes, it'll change. But that, yeah, that was yeah, pretty so much that, like we went down there, set up some spots, and then came down and hunted the second time. And then this time I felt like, you know, I, I had a lot better, I guess, success in my plan just because I eliminated some of them spots and didn't go into them and kind of focused on some uh, more consistent uh, wind current areas based on the conditions I had. And I, w- I was real happy with the results, you know, now just, just a matter of identifying more of those spots and then matching up them good spots with, like, potential deer activity in the future. And you know, going in there now, you know, when we first went in there, it was greened up and it was just like a wall of thicket in a a lot of the places we went to. And there was no sign, there was no trails just because it was too greened up and there's not a lot of deer density. You know, they're so spread out and they're not just banging the same trails to the same ag field over and over. It isn't just like one bedding to one food source. It's like these, these deer are just like here one week and here a week later and might not be back for another week. So just a matter of um, 
you know, identifying where they're going to be at, you know. And then looking back, you know, you get into some areas where you found some old scrapes and you found some really good rubs, but they were, you know, a week ago. But looking at it, if we hunt this next year, those are good spots to anticipate to be in next year at, at you know, a week ago's time, like maybe early November be in those spots because anticipating them deer being in there, staging a little bit, and, uh, you know, basing that off this year's movement in, in this big chunk of timber. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, Brandon. Yeah, for sure. You know, and what's cool about that is I think both me and Sean ran into some spots where we found some of that sign, and it was really, I mean, again, to kind of, you know, overemphasize what Sean's saying is, like, early in the year, man, it really was the truth. Like, me and Sean kind of looked at each other and just were like, man, it's so hard to find any deer sign. We found some old rubs and stuff like that, but you couldn't see definite trails. You, you, you know, with the land and so much of that movement being vertical, and it's all timber, so that means a lot of those trails would literally need to be dug out, like I'm talking from the earth three or four or five inches deep, just to see one. And we did see some of those trails, or I've begun to see some. But with the amount of leaves from being an all-timbered area, it just covers up a lot of that just day-to-day movement that you just kind of miss. But uh, as we got going, you know, me and Sean started to see in separate areas, you know, like rubs that we ended up finding that were really fresh in an area that you would really, you know, if you could spend some time in and get to properly, you I, I really believe, you know, it was the right area for both of us in two different spots that we would end it up in a week killing deer there. And, uh, you know, I just wish for both me and Sean, like the time we got there, we found those spots right away versus like hunting some and then, you know, trying to scout. It just makes it really hard when you're, you're on a piece that big your first time. And, uh, you know, I, I know both me and Sean, like, every day we want to spend as many hours in the stand as we can, but it's like you got to scout a little bit, too, to to keep progressing and, and maybe getting in deeper or getting in a different direction and trying to pinpoint those deer. But I think that was one of the biggest challenges for me, Sean, as we talked about it a lot, and it just kind of laughed about how, like, I would almost stand there and be indecisive about it, like, do I spend more time in stand or do I go and scout this next area? And it was just like a, a constant dilemma in your own mind. But, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think, like Sean said, we're, we're literally on the cusp of really getting it figured out, figured it out. And it would, it's going to be so much easier for us, you know, next year, Sean, like walking in the door for me and you. I, I think we'll have, for one, so much more confidence. It's old hat. And, and we're, like I said, right at the end there, we're, we're, starting to find sign like like crazy like i wish we would have right off the get-go you know yeah and all you can do is like you that's like any hunt anywhere is just remembering or logging that sign and just anticipating that deer next year and if you find something good like we were looking the first time we went down here and scouted a lot of that sign we were seeing were in areas where i was like man how are you gonna get back here without you know busting all the deer out and then also getting back in there without like drenching your clothes because a lot of that sign was down a valley and then up another slope. And then a lot of that sign, I didn't really get that excited about. We were seeing rubs, but nothing was anything that was making me jump out of my boots when I saw it. So, you know, I feel like I found some some rubs that, you know, if the deer make it to next year, which there's probably a good chance they will, um, getting in those areas about the time they're going to start staging in those areas next year is probably a good um a good point to to do yeah for sure and have something decent you know it seems mm-hmm. like i mean obviously compared to michigan there's not nearly the hunting pressure and it's a huge huge area not just the section we're hunting but me and sean can drive roads down there and it's not even like michigan as far as the roads go there for us to get somewhere that is 10 or 12 miles it takes 30 minutes because you can't just like fly across on a diagonal from A to B, the shortest route to get there. You have to go way north and then way east and then come back south to get into a spot. So what what that does, it just, it does create really great deer habitat. There's less roads, a little bit less human pressure, 
with that being mm-hmm. said, you know, less, you know, even just car, de- deer and car vehicle accidents, the less of that seems to happen out down there. And uh, I think in a four hour drive, I only counted two, two dead deer. And, and obviously that's not relative to where we're hunting, but just overall in general, just a lot less roads equals mm-hmm. less human pressure. And, uh, mm-hmm. And even poaching pressure, just any type of pressure. And uh, some of that land, I I just didn't notice, like, the local homes. I didn't notice a lot of hunting pressure from anybody coming in or out or a vehicle pulling in and hunters getting out of vehicles. Didn't notice that. The only pressure me and Sean did notice were maybe the other guys on our lease or at least next door to us where there was guys there just just for hunting. So I thought that was a really good sign, you know, overall. And I was there on opening day of youth gun season. So the youth in Ohio, they get to, you know, a weekend to gun hunt. From zero dark 30 to 4 p.m., I heard one gunshot. Now in Michigan, you would have heard, you know, easily I would have heard 10 to 20 in an area. So I heard one. So, again, that's a really good sign, and I think, you know, moving forward, it just kind of gives me and Sean, again, some more comfort in the fact that there's less hunting pressure. We ended up getting a lot of good deer on trail camera to, you know, to go along with what I'm saying. It's less hunting pressure produces age structure, and uh, that's what we have down there, man. We got some deer that are, are definitely older and, you know, on the on the very good side of genetics as well. So I think, you know, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all those things are just really positive to what we were trying to figure out down there. Oh, I think that's all, that's, that's all good. You know, you're not hearing the, you know, the shots on that youth season and you're not seeing, you're not bumping into a lot of people, even though like, you know, there is, you know, there is pressure on it. You know, you know, we're seeing other guys, feeders, or other guys, cameras, there's just so much ground that we're not we're not bumping into each other. You know, if there is somebody in the, in an area, we can move off and try and find an area that's not being pressured as much. I guess. Yeah, I mean that's the truth. There is guys on our lease, so me and Sean do have to work around them. So there's going to be pressure from the other hunters that participate in our lease. So luckily, Sean ran into a few of the guys. I ran into a few of the other guys, and. Uh, you know, from that end, it seemed to be very good and positive. Everybody seemed to be on the same page as, you know, like wanting to shoot upper end deer and older deer. Uh, mostly mm-hmm. from what I heard of the guys that I met, it was all about age and not so much the size of a deer. And I, obviously, all of us want to shoot big deer down there. But it was nice just to get on that level with them, that they were comfortable just sharing some information and you know, this is pretty common down there where guys share leases, so to speak. So, you know, one thing that me and Sean learned was, you know, like I stopped twice back to back days and both guys ended up talking to me for an hour. Now that was an hour of time that was very valuable to me, but in the same token, I got a ton of valuable information from those guys, what they had learned the previous year on that lease when they got there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's just all important stuff to kind of like good tip wise, like if you're in this situation where we we are or, you know, some states call it hunting clubs or whatever it may be, or you get in a lease with your buddy and his buddies, but it, it, it's good to kind of get that information and take that time and that it's kind of just overall part of the game there, trying to figure out something so immense. I mean, you're talking 1,200 acres where a lot of it is vertical which really, really stretches out that property and it makes it so big. So like Sean was saying, like there is a little bit of pressure from the other guys on the lease, obviously, but if if you keep learning and getting that little bit of information, it it was pretty easy for us to kind of work around these guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the spots like to make it up to, like you make it up a 300 foot incline, that's going to take you, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I didn't time it, but I would imagine... 30 minutes to slowly move up it without drenching your clothes. And then from there, you know, then you're walking a ridge back in, which you could go in a half mile or a mile. 
So you're talking about yeah, penetrating the property. I don't know if I yeah. went in the right direction with that, but. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fine. But yeah, I mean, it is, Sean is right. Like it is a, again, that another thing you learn about being down there is it's a time thing. You need a little more time to walk into a spot. And that spot is vertical majority of the time. So to get away from somebody, you're usually going up and, you know, it produces body heat and it takes a lot of extra energy. So you need a little extra time. And plus down there, man, I've never heard a place like Ohio in this timber that is as noisy as it is. You can't walk anywhere and be stealthy, you know, unless you just had a rain or a good fog or, you know, the the temperature dropped and it just produced some moisture. But you know, it, it's best to get in there and just try to get in there right ahead of everybody and then, you know, take your time to get to a spot because, man, it is just uh, it's just unique in that manner. It just makes everything about this part of Ohio super challenging. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to access quietly unless you've got some, some cover, like if it's wet leaves or if you've got some wind. Yeah, exactly right. It just seems yeah, like it, so. you get in those on those – hills or them valleys and it's just if it's quiet and dry like those leaves are just crunching and they're echoing off everything else so it's just kind of alerting all the deer that's that's just part of the i guess the fun or the uh the tough access is just trying to figure a way to get to where you need to get without blowing all the deer off the area that you're trying to get to yeah you know and i went and scouted some areas and and i was in contact with sean and was like man i didn't even see a deer I didn't jump a deer and your mind starts to play tricks on you like man this is depressing I don't know where the deer are we're not finding them we're not on them I'm like man you can't actually after the fact you know thinking about it I can't walk into a spot a mile back practically and expect to see those deer in those types of you know conditions because I literally at every step I'm just alerting the deer so I'm sure the deer just Uh all moved out I had bumped who knows how many deer in front of me but in the same token, like, you have to go in and penetrate a little bit to discover these areas and to see that sign. But, you know, like I said, you just kind of got to keep filtering out the negatives with the positives of what's going on, you know, when you're doing something like that. Because, again, it, this isn't like me and Sean can walk at the edge of a soybean or a cut cornfield and sneak in 50 feet in the timber. It's not like that. It is ridges up and down, full of leaves, trees everywhere. And uh, it's really hard to be stealthy. So that's really part of the game plan there, too, is, is like Sean said, is trying to figure out enough of a way to get into a spot without blowing these deer, but a spot far enough that the deer are still comfortable and near their bedding and near where they live. So, you know, and another thing that was just a challenge for me and Sean, and it's none of our fault, but it's a timber community down there, so people work. And that, that's their industry. Well, on both sides of our lease, the north and south side, the guys were working dead nuts on our property lines. But, you know, not on our lease, so to speak. So that created challenges because there's big machines. It's super loud, super noisy. And they're moving semis, trailers, full, full of giant 30-feet log timber in and out of an area. And those timber machines that cut down the trees, man, they're not quiet by any means. And, uh, you know, me and Sean were on a really regular pattern in one of our spots that it was like clockwork. We were getting deer, and then all of a sudden the timber company moved in, and it literally, I mean, I I was surprised it shut it down this much. It shut it down completely. It killed it. it. And me and Sean never got another picture of a shooter buck. Go ahead, Sean. They were in there on a regular basis. We were getting some good deer in there, and, you know, at least one really good shooter, and then when they started cutting, it just killed that area. The camera just stopped. I mean, nothing. I mean, so. nothing. Like, literally nothing. So, yeah. and uh, I snuck over there one day, and the timber company wasn't there. So I was like, hey, Sean, like, Friday afternoon, these guys aren't here early afternoon. I bet you, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, you know, these deer will kind of eventually cycle back through. Well, gave it some time, stuck back in there Monday morning. Man, the timber company was right back in there again working, unbeknownst to me, in the dark, you know, at 
5.30 a.m. And again, didn't see anything. So it's just, you know, unfortunate that was one of our primo spots and it totally just got lambasted, you know. Yeah. So all you can do is, uh, you know, you know the deer moved back, so now it was it, it was just a matter of, like, can we relocate them again, and do we have enough time to do it again? So, but... Yeah, uh, we, were having, we were having some bad luck in that little spot there, that dead-end road spot, both of us, so... Yeah, yeah we were, so... You want to tell them about how, how they are beeping their horn to get you out of there? Yeah, so, like, I mean, both of us really had bad luck there, so that's really funny. So yeah. I go in there in the dark... Because I'm like, like I said, from Friday to Monday, I was like, man, I bet you, you know, if they weren't here working today on Friday, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, there's a good chance like that first set of deer might be rolling in there again. So light comes up. I'm all excited. Like, you know, this, you know, based on the previous history of the photos, me and Sean know like that spot will produce at some point. And, uh, man, 745, I hear the timber company they they start up again and I'm like, Oh man, you gotta be kidding me. So then I hear just like machines and it sounds like they're scratching the cement and we're parked on a road that was closed and they had those giant, you know, like uh cement barricades. You know, they probably weighed two thousand pounds a piece and uh the road is completely closed, the access there. So I'm just hearing like for three machines months. and they, yeah, for three plus months, you know, at least we know it was closed all the way back to September. So, and it previously yeah. it could have been closed, you know, who knows how many months before that. So I'm hearing machines are revving their engines, all kinds of crazy stuff. Then I'm hearing just horns beeping and I'm like, man, it doesn't sound like a car, but it sounds like a, you know, like it's one of those machines, but it's something is beeping nonstop at me and it's literally blowing its horn. So eventually, I just like against my will, I'm like, this is totally wrecked. I'm getting down. I have to go. Like, this sucks. I'm not going to mm-hmm. see a deer. Like, I literally convinced myself by one hour later. This is 745 to 845 from the time the timber company started. So I'm like, I'm out of here. I go down. They got three big, giant, basically the equivalent to a bobcat, but a bigger one. And they're moving those cement pylons or barricades and she this woman comes up to me and goes sorry we wrecked your hunt but we got to we're opening this road today <laughs> mm-hmm. so besides the Denver company working cutting down trees just 300 yards away they were blowing at me to get me to come down there and move my car it was unbelievable so i was like yeah mm-hmm. yeah you pretty much did ruin my hunt but thanks you know like what am i supposed to do you know so just literally yeah. on my last yeah, you know, basically my last morning set. That's how it ended. So that was that was really a bummer. So fast forward, I'll let Sean finish the rest. But was it that night or the next night, Sean? I don't even remember. Two nights now. I don't know. But um, I think it was the next night. I don't the know, next maybe, night. Oh, I'm trying to think. I was there. Um, I'm gonna say that it was that. What was it? I don't even know. It was that night or the night the next night. Okay, I go to yeah, the same regardless. Spot. But and they, yeah, within they had, 24 they had hours. The road. Yeah, they had opened the road and literally like, I've never seen a car come down this road. It's been dead end road because they had it blocked off. It was closed. So I pull up as far as I can to the the rail on the road and uh, get out and go in like I've hunted there the last few times and. I get up the 300-foot hill, and then I get about a half mile down a ridge, and I end up running into two other hunters that I got set up, and there these two guys come, and I didn't know if they were trespassers or guys from the lease. I thought they were trespassers because I was just like, there's no way for anybody to get back in here other than to come from the private. But it turns out it was guys in our lease, and I talked to them the next day. But when I hiked back that night, I mean, I'm talking, I'm hiking – you know, three quarters of a mile back and down this 300 foot hill. And I get down there where my truck's supposed to be at. And it's, it's dark. And I got a black truck. And I'm thinking I couldn't see it. So I was like, oh, maybe it's just, I can't see it. It's up the road a little bit more. Maybe I didn't park there. I parked farther down. So I walk and walk and I come to this little survey stake that I remember parking my truck right by and, it, and uh, my truck wasn't there. So I go, man, maybe there's another one of these stakes down the road. So I walk about another hundred yards and my truck's not there. And I'm like, I don't know what to do at this point. It either got stole or it was towed. So I ended up calling 911 
and uh, they put me through to county sheriff, and I talked to the deputy that they went out there, and somebody called in a, an abandoned vehicle, and he came out there, and he deemed it a road hazard being parked parked where it was at, and it was as far off the road as I could get it, and there was enough room for other cars to get through because there was a car that had came around me right when I was parking, and uh, I'm, st- I'm stuck out there, no truck, 30 minutes from my hotel, you know, in the middle of nowhere. Just I had no idea what I was going to do. But luckily, the, uh, the tow truck dispatched that the wrecker back to me with my truck, and I was able to get that taken care of. That was a pretty crazy, uh, crazy experience. I don't know what I would have mm-hmm. what I would have done if uh, they wouldn't have brought that brought my truck back to me. Yeah, you know, totally crazy. And again, we're thirty minutes from the hotel, and the way the roads are, like you, it'd be impossible. Sean couldn't walk there. You know, like I couldn't walk there. Like you just you just can't. It's so crazy, but uh, that's insane okay, that that happened, the luck- Sean. Yeah, I, was, I said I was the luckiest unlucky person <laughs> yeah i mean to be able like for that guy to turn around and actually not have it to where he was going yet which was probably the inbound yeah. yard and luckily yeah. still have it on the tow truck and was able to come back and get you as as uh obviously is a super blessing and at least that part of it man I, i'm absolutely happy for sean that you know he wasn't stuck out there all night and something you yeah. know worse happened but but man that was a bummer and it, it just go to show it, like it's a, it's, a, it's a good sign, though. I think that's a good spot because obviously somebody didn't want us hunting there. Right. Yeah, that's what that because. kind of what that told me too. Yeah. So, I definitely think uh, that is one of our better spots that we learned, which was great. But you know, it's just a bummer that uh, that's why we do this podcast. Is just like good, bad, or indifferent. Like we're going to share and talk about you know the experiences, and and that's just something that you learn. So. You know, I don't even know what Sean could have done or where, you know, now that the road is not closed, like we obviously have to re kind of evaluate where we can park there safely and not get called. And uh, I, I'm even like literally Sean going to think of going as far as like putting a little uh, a note in my driver's side window and just say like, hey, I'm hunting. Please don't tow this car because <laughs> I don't know if there is yeah. another spot to park. Yeah, just leave a phone number for them to call you. So yeah, exactly. spot there just farther down. You know what? And I was trying to be, you know, conscious of that. There was a, there's a house down there that I didn't want to park right in front of their house where I could have got off, you know, on either side of the road a lot farther, but I didn't want to park right in front of their house. But right. if that's the only safe place to do it, then that's where then we're going to so park at. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. But, but I'm with you there. I mean, I would have tried to avoid their house, you know, like I don't, I don't want, yeah. you know, anybody to feel, uh, insecure about a vehicle just sitting in front of their house for eight hours a day while I'm hunting. But, you know, at the same time, like we have to access that property from somewhere. So, you know, Mm -hmm. we're going to park somewhere eventually, but, you know, I was just trying like on the same line, you know, I don't want to be rude to anybody, especially local and, um, you know, but we'll figure that part out for sure. Next time we go down, there might be a better spot now that the roads open and in the daylight, you know, we might be able to see it a little better. But, uh, you know, from there, you know, uh, gun season starts Monday, but Ohio does have a very long extended season, you know, relatively speaking in Michigan. So me and Sean got a lot of time to get back down there and and do some hunting. So I think, uh, you know, me and Sean are really on the same page as far as like kind of tinkering with the maps and looking at stuff and trying to figure things out. So I'm sure between now and then we'll, you know, we'll come up with some more ideas and, and plug away, but uh, I think the more we learn about it, we're kind of, you know, still as interested as ever and kind of maybe even a little more fired up to kind of, you know, put this puzzle together and, and get down there and hunt some more. Oh, yeah, that, and that's the cool thing about it is um, it is tough hunting, and it is uh, it's a little bit more difficult of a puzzle to put together, and I find it, I find it challenging, and every time I, you know, come home from this place um, – you know, I feel like I've learned a lot and I got a better plan for next time coming down. And then also when I get home and a lot of other places to hunt, like whether it's, you know, Indiana, Michigan, uh, it's like a lot of those spots, it's it's just, um, it seems a little bit easier to hunt those. So I come back and it, it, it just seems like it's easier now to hunt the current pieces I have that's farther north. 
I don't yeah, think it felt I agree. like that I, at I, all. I, yeah, totally, man. I was just going to mention that, that uh, I feel like it's been such a challenge down there. You know, it's a little bit, obviously, it's, I don't want to say a little bit. For, for most, it's way more physical, for one. And it's, you know, being that it's not something from the eye that you can just say, well, like, here's a pinch or here's a funnel, you know, or here's a cutoff that I can get on the deer. There's There really isn't that because it just is a sea of timber. And, uh, you know, but with that said, all those challenges, it, it's be kind of kind of become like addicting to where I'm like, man, I I, I want to go right now. I want to get back down there and do this again and uh, grind it out. Just the physical part and the, the mental part of it has really kind of just, you know, got to me to where I'm like, man, I just can't wait to do it again. And and what Sean said about up here, man, it's the same thing. I'm almost like, wow, that it's made this uh, – here in Michigan, at least my stuff. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's made it just, I'm like, wow, this is simple, you know. Like, doesn't mean yeah. the deer are going to be there because it's still Michigan, but at least, you know, just dissecting it has made it simple because you really have to go kind of some next-level stuff in, on this Ohio property. But, uh, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah I might have to totally go back. the truth, Sean. Might, yeah, you might have to go back a half mile, but you're not trying to scale a 300-foot hill to get there. Right. You know, in Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, but anyways, with that said, I guess me and Sean will, you know, hopefully make it down there again and uh, have a, at least a better update. But I, I feel like overall me and Sean had really done good as far as, you know, until the timber stuff happened. Like, we, you know, we had a couple cameras that were really turned on, one that was kind of a dud you know, and it was just based on the fact that once the cover came down from all the leaves and foliage, it was way too close to the road. I mean, Sean just didn't notice that when we had set up that area. But, uh, and it had literally another hunter. And again, that's out of our control. One of the guys from the lease was not, I mean, wasn't a hundred yards away from us at least. And uh, yeah. if that, he might not even been a hundred. So that, that was a little bit too close. And I think his pressure kind of ended up working against us in that spot, obviously. But uh, with that said, Sean, like, I'm just, you know, whatever, man, we're, we'll get back down when we can. And I'm excited as ever to kind of, you know, hopefully one of us have success. I, I I believe it will happen. I just think me and you just need that little bit of extra more time to get down there and, and keep hunting. Yeah, I do too. Are you going to get down there for the, for the firearm? I am going to figure that out here in the next day, so hopefully. So if I can get all the all right. basically like honeydew list here, you know, which is getting up yeah. these lights and Christmas tree and, and outdoor stuff, uh, I'm going to yeah. head down there and hunt for sure. So I may not right. gun hunt per se. I'll, I'll throw the orange vest on and just keep bow hunting, but uh, yeah, I would love to just go down there and experience it as just part of the culture of like a opening day yeah. gun. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah, so... But uh, that's all I got. You got anything else, Sean? No, that's pretty much it. I mean, just getting back down there with the information. Like I said, the, the biggest thing is, you know, we I was able to get up on them tops and actually see where, what certain areas were and, you know, looking at them topple maps and being able to come home and then look at the topple maps and, and have a better idea of what I'm looking at and pick out some other spots that are probably going to be, you know, fruitful that's probably yeah. the biggest takeaway yeah for sure is uh you know once you uh you know walk in and get to spend some time there or walk parts of it you can really like sean said kind of dissect those maps a little bit better you know from uh using a hunt stand or whatever but you know it's really helped out like it's one thing to see it before you get down there on an app, but once you sit there and you get to walk some of it and you can tell really how big and deep some of these ridges are and some of these tops, it really changes. And uh, that was another another thing I didn't, to go along with this, Sean, I didn't really mention. Some of the tops, to me, weren't nearly as big as what I thought they would be, which is crazy. I thought we would have room to really hunt but it, on some of those areas, but uh, we don't really. It seems like we're hunting a lot of the shelves. But a lot of those tops, it seems like those deer kind of come up, they crest, and they keep it moving, so to speak. So it's really interesting just what we've learned, and, you know, we'll we'll obviously continue to learn, you know, as Uh we go. So, but, yeah, yeah, that's it. 
Yeah, me too. So I'm sure, obviously, me and Sean will talk more about it, you know, as we go on. But, uh, you know, just wanted to give you guys a quick update and uh, excited to get the show out to everybody. And I'm sure me and Sean will hopefully be back down there at the same time again and, and we can plug along another show like this because I just think it's interesting how much we've learned and how fast we've progressed since, you know, like literally mine and Sean's first time there was September. So we've done really good since then and, and hopefully it just kicks on. So we'll do it again, Sean. All right. Sounds good. All right, buddy. Thanks. And uh, we'll see you guys right. again next week. All right. Thanks.